Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this event, which is hosted by Knox College. My name is John Vissers, and it's my privilege to serve as principal of the college and to welcome you here to this space and to this event this afternoon. Knox College was founded in 1844, and we are a college of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Uh, we're also a founding member of the Toronto School of Theology, and we're part of and affiliated with the University of Toronto. And today we gather for the Robert Laidlaw Memorial Lecture. This lectureship was established in 1953 by Walter C. Laidlaw and Robert Laidlaw, uh, the two sons of a man named Robert Laidlaw to honor their father by bringing distinguished scholars uh, to the college uh, to speak and to lecture and to engage with our community. And since its establishment in 1953, more than 30 distinguished theologians and scholars have come to the college from Europe, from Asia, and from North America to give these lectures, including such people as Brevard Childs, uh, Sally McFaig, uh, Miroslav Wolf, and others. The last late law lecture was given in 2018 by Dr. Sebastian Kim. And the lecture promotes a critical theological thinking to strengthen the college's engagement with the church and with the academy and with the wider world. And today we are especially honored and delighted to host Professor Dana Robert who will be introduced uh, more formally in a moment by Professor Akalazzi, Professor Esther Akalazzi of our college. And I'm also delighted to welcome uh, Professor Glenn Taylor from Wycliffe College, who will be our respondent. Just before I turn it over to Professor Akalazzi, let me just say how delighted I am that Professor Robert is able to be with us today to give the Laidlaw Lecture. She was scheduled to be our commencement speaker, our convocation speaker last May, but of course, as we all know, plans change due to the pandemic. But we are really delighted that she's here today uh, to give this lecture out of her work, or her life's work really in research in world Christianity and mission. So we're looking forward to an excellent presentation by Professor Robert, uh, followed by Dr. Uh, Taylor's response, and then an opportunity for questions and for some discussion. And so with that, again, welcome uh, to this space and to this event uh, at Knox College. And I'm going to turn things over now to my colleague, Professor Astel Esther Akalazzi, who is hosting really this event for us and uh, who holds the chair in pastoral theology and Intercultural Studies at Knox College, and uh, who will now take over. Professor Akalazzi. Thank you, Dr. Vizas. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Dana Robert. She is a Truman Collins Professor of World Christianity and History of Mission at Boston University School of Theology. She holds a PhD from Yale University and, he, and she has an arm length of books too numerous to, uh, to list here. Among her books are American Women in Mission, A Social History of Their Thought and Practice in 1997, Christian Mission, how Christianity Became a World Religion, published in 2009, African Christian Biography in 2018, and Faithful Friendships Embracing Diversity in Christian Community in 2019. Dr. Robert was keynote speaker at the Edinburgh 2010 Conference commemorating the centennial of the World Missionary Conference. In 2017, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award 
of the American Society of Missiology, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is married to the Zimbabwean missiologist M. L. Denier. At the Boston University School of Theology, Dr. Roberts directs the Center for Global Christianity and Mission. The center sponsors collaborative digital humanities projects, including the Dictionary of African Christian Biography and the China Christian Posters website. Currently, the Center for Global Christian Mission is coordinating the mission study process for the North American region in advance of the 2022 Assembly of the World Council of Churches. More recently, she stepped into the role of co-convener for the Yale Edinburgh Group for the Study of World Christianity after the passing of Lamin Sane. Please join me welcome Dr. Robert as she brings us her lecture titled Constructing World Fellowship, Christian Practices and Insights from a Century Ago. Dr. Roberts, welcome. Thank you, Professor Akalazi. It's a wonderful honor to be here today. I'm sorry not to see you live, but this will have to do. It's a great honor to be invited to give the Laidlaw Lecture and I'm grateful to Principal Vissers for inviting me and to Professors Taylor and Akalazi for hosting the lecture. Now, I used to joke for years that I was interested in everything except Europe, but I'm afraid today you're going to get some of my research that is on a bit on Europe 100 years ago. We're coming up to anniversaries of the International Missionary Council, the life and work movement and other things that happened a century ago. So my research has been, my historical research is in this direction now. So I would like to talk about that. I'm going to screen share and um, let's see how this goes. All right, is, uh, let's see if the screen share is working. I hope you all can see it. Wonderful. In divisive times such as this, religious leaders must nurture visions of global com community and the practices that support it. Despite death, destruction, racism, and autocracy, we believe in the promise of shalom the state of peace, justice, and love to which Jesus devoted his life. So those of us teaching in theological schools must keep asking the difficult questions. How do we unite people across boundaries? How do Christians show love and compassion to people they perceive as perhaps unlike themselves? How do we heal the brokenness of creation and point toward the beloved community? As historian and missiologist, I turn to history today to illuminate practices of Christian community and show their relevance to the present. I hope my research contributes to what Charles Fincham calls a public missiology, the sharing of our Christian ideals writ large and the application of our cosmic hopes to the public realm. So today I invite you to let your imagination roam to another time of deep trauma, a time in which Christian fellowship and the practices that supported it became an urgent public priority. A hundred years ago, Europe lay in ruins. Survivors of the World War navigated destroyed infrastructures, the death of millions, cultural collapse, and a global flu pandemic. Afterward, Europe was divided into ethnic states. Militant nationalisms and mass migrations of newly minoritized peoples resulted. And of course, we know in the meantime, European imperialists had carved up parts of Asia and all of Africa and were determined to hang on to them despite resistance. Crumbling empire exploited religious differences 
Now, Christianity was the supposed religion of most Europeans, but it seemed completely ineffective in the public square. It was divided into competing national churches with centuries of hostility among Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox. And yet, inspired by their faith, many Christians still dared to dream of fellowship, often expressed in the language of the kingdom of God. The worse the suffering, the more people yearned for something higher and better than themselves. At a practical and theological level, church leaders sought forgiveness and reconciliation. Reconstructing community, they believed, would bring healing and hope. And so they turned to new theologies of fellowship and friendship across ethnic and national boundaries. And I've found in my research that the 1920s saw an explosion of writings on the theology of fellowship by a wide range of stakeholders. In his 1913 book, The Problem of Christianity, philosopher Josiah Royce called the Christian vision of universal fellowship the, the beloved community. He argued that the individual was of infinite worth in the beloved community. And the individual is meaningless without community. And here's the quotation that he, he put forward that is so important. Individuals without community are without substance, while communities without individuals are blind. Thus, Christians must work together to build community that transcends but incorporates individuals, races, and nations. Now, Royce died in 1916, but the concept of beloved community was part of the vision that animated the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Another view of fellowship that came about in the 20s. In 1926, the future Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, published Personal Life and Fellowship. This striking little volume sent the systematized and integrative social philosophy in which fellowship was the glue that held together individual personhood with the kingdom of God. Temple believed that starting with individual commitment one at a time would, it, would create expanding rings of fellowship that would move us toward the reign of God what he called the universal brotherhood of all nations and all races. In other words, Christian fellowship offered a moral and spiritual grounding that secular politics did not. And so he called for conversion within the church itself to the bigger vision of relevance in the public realm. Now I'd like to explore just three of the ways in which these ideas of world fellowship, beloved community, and the kingdom of God played themselves out in the 1920s. So the next part of my lecture is looking at finding fellowship after the Great War. First, let's look at commitment to peace through friendship and justice. In August 1914, the outbreak of World War actually broke up the founding meeting of what was called the World Alliance for International Friendship through the Churches. Church leaders meeting in Constance, Germany had to flee for their lives or they would be trapped by the outbreak of the war behind German lines. And the, the first documented gathering of the international church after the war was this group, the World Alliance, when on October 1st, 1919, 60 church leaders from Great Britain, the USA, Belgium, Italy, and France met in The Hague. The German delegation in a historic statement took moral spot responsibility for the invasion of Belgium in 1915. And Archbishop, future Archbishop Nathan Soderblom of Sweden described it thus, he said, with aching hearts, losses in their families, and destitution in their nations, and with understandable distrust evoked by opposition and falsehood, 
they still joined together and sang our father and forgive us our trespasses. So the post-war meetings of church leaders were an effort to put a soul back into the secular body of nations striving for peace. They committed themselves to Christian fellowship. Now, during 1920s, leaders in the Alliance began organizing branches throughout Europe and North America, and they came to object to the punitive treaty against Germany, the failure of the US Senate to ratify the League of Nations, and their magazine, World Friendship, began printing their common declaration in every issue. And this was their declaration. We believe in the power of friendship to establish right relationships between the nations and to secure universal peace. And that friendship is based upon justice. So what kind of issues animated this group? Well, one thing they were concerned about was US hypocrisy against the Japanese in California. The Alliance targeted the persecution of Koreans by Japanese occupational forces. It supported disarmament and peace building. It lobbied for the League of Nations. They grappled with the religious persecution, including the killing of Armenians and the communist victory in Russia. Hungarian diplomat John Polenyi spoke and said that friendship is the one great hope of a sorely tried world. And as the leaders of the Alliance for Friendship toured Europe, they just saw massive destruction everywhere. So the end of the war is not the same thing as the beginning of peace. And Francis Clark noted, he said, Never since the days of Napoleon were hate, suspicion, jealousy, and selfish aggrandizement so rife in the world as now. And he pointed to passport difficulties, police regulations, strong borders, and the, the rigidity and cruelty at borders as a way of, of eliminating the kind of fellowship that Christians called for. Yet, Clark also noted signs of hope. American and British Quakers went to repair houses in Poland, France, and Austria. They tried to supply seeds and livestock and bees to peasant farmers. Orthodox and Protestants in the Balkans tried to put forward a common witness. So what you see in these movements for peace and justice is that the personal and the political could not be separated. And that's one of the main points about what was happening a year ago, uh, a century ago, is the building of personal relationships was all of a piece with these larger issues of justice. Now, this, the next group I'd like to look at for, that sought fellowship was student movements. And here they were characterized by welcoming the stranger and meeting human need. Now, given that the armies of Europe were full of students, the end of the war saw hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students in crisis with no homes to return to and completely traumatized. Thus helping and healing students from moral injury was a major task of the World Student Christian Federation. Founded in 1895, the WSCF linked national student Christian movements, mostly in Europe, Asia, and North America, though they also had branches in South Africa. So many student leaders died in combat during the war. But still, even during the war, heroic and moving stories came out from among students who recognized each other and prayed for each other in a student day of prayer, even in the midst of World War I. Now the first post-war meeting of the World Student Christian Federation in April of 1919 took place at the bedside of John R. Mott in a French hospital. Mott was recovering from the Spanish flu a pandemic that killed 50 million people, millions more than did the Great War. So one thing that's similar with us and a century ago is global pandemic 
And so we can imagine what it might, might have been like to try to reconnect after a global war and a global pandemic. German leaders did not attend this first meeting, but here's some of the folks who attended. You can see there was, the, there was a Swedish guy, a British woman, and also a Chinese vice chairman, Cheng Teng Wang, who was attending the Paris Peace Conference. And this group determined to relaunch a student movement and try to reconnect students throughout the world. So they traveled around reconstituting executives in each country. And this required new leadership because of the deaths of so many. Almost the entire leadership of the French student movement had been killed in the war. And prominent theologians such as Wilfred Monod and Raoul, Raoul Allier plunged themselves into student work in place of the sons of theirs that had been killed in the war. So older theologians and seminary professors took the place of their own children in trying to support the student movement after the war. The challenges were almost insurmountable because the shifting boundaries created, created new groups of alienated um, ethnic pockets of people almost on a, a monthly basis. There were post-war armies of occupation. Student leaders needed to be cultivated from what Ruth Rouse called hordes of ragged, starving, and homeless students. The, and I'm still quoting, quoting her here. She said, the Federation had to rebuild its work amid plagues, pestilence, and famine, while battle, murder, and sudden death had not ceased. So the, the, these obstacles were formidable. Now, how do you repair this? How do you put to get back together bitter, cynical, and psychologically and spiritually damaged student warriors? including demoralized soldiers trying to return home. Here, an ethic of Christian fellowship was necessary for survival itself. Thus, cross-cultural friendship was a political act. Now, how did the students try to do this? Well, unlike college campuses today, urban universities in the early 1900s provided few amenities and no social space for students. Students lived in miserable walk-ups and isolated from each other. Well, world student worker Elizabeth Clark, working in alliance with Christian women in Geneva in 1909 had already opened a student hostel, which was a drop-in center for students to come to just have a cup of tea, to sit by a warm fire and to meet each other across national boundaries. The philosophy of the foyer movement was aptly summed up by Clark in her statement, one of my favorite mission quotes. She said, one must always appreciate the importance of a cup of tea in the evangelization of the world. So in addition to providing life-saving hospitality, the workers held religious meetings for students recreational outings and assisted them in searching for decent housing. This was a huge crisis, both during and after the war. So this foyer movement spreads throughout Europe during the war. And many, many students had been stranded during World War I. So Clark herself found herself assisting roughly 1500 starving Russian women students many of them suicidal who were stranded in Switzerland during the war. In London, organizers found 22 different nationalities of stranded students who had no support from their home country, were in many cases homeless and hungry. So they started these houses of fellowship that were characterized by cross-cultural co-living arrangements and acted as headquarters for their various projects. So another thing that we see happening after the war is something called European student relief. Upon visiting Europe, uh, Eastern Europe in 1920, Ruth Rouse realized that the students of Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland were literally starving to death. So she put out a universal appeal for money to feed, clothe, and encourage self-help for students in Europe. 
supported by contributions from college students in North America, Australia, and other countries that had escaped this destruction. This group served over 25 million meals over a four, million pe four year period. In Russia during the famine, it gave a daily meal to 31,000 students. Demoralized Polish soldiers had literally been stripped of their army uniforms and left shivering in rags by um, after this. So they were clothed by European student relief. American students sent suits to Russian students. So you can see that, you know, a kind of economic self-help model coming out of this charity of students. In 1922, European Student Relief brokered a meeting of 80 different students hostile to each other in Turnoff, Bohemia. Now, why did they do this? They brought them together in a bombed out area. They had Marxist students, they had Christian students, they had fascist students, they had communist students. And they said, we have to start, if students of the world can't communicate with each other, where's the hope for peace? Simultaneously, the World Student Christian Federation was meeting in Peking with mostly Asian delegates. And the Chinese and your other Asian delegates sent telegrams to the European students pledging support for them. So what you've got is Chinese students trying to help Russian students, American students trying to help Russian students, um, British students trying to help Polish students. You, it, was, it was this movement of help. Now, hard on the heels of student relief was something called pilgrimages of friendship, where there started to be organized um, you, what we today might call immersion experiences or travel study tours, except in the case of the pilgrimages of friendship, you were taking groups of students to meet needy students in other countries. And these were friendship groups. They started by going to Europe, then to Japan, and then to Mexico with the explicit purpose of cultivating interracial friendships. By 1924, this movement had spread to the segregated American South, where black and white students start going to joint YMCA, YWCA meetings in order to promote interracial friendship. And here I have a picture of Howard and Sue Bailey Thurman, who went on a pilgrimage of friendship in 1935. Very famously, that's where Howard Thurman met Gandhi and they start bringing back ideals of Gandhi's method and such back to the United States. So what were all these students trying to do? They were welcoming the stranger. They were holding conferences. They were sending each other on pilgrimages of friendship and providing physical assistance to each other. Students grasped a vision of beloved community, even as their countries were lurching toward World War II. A third major area of work in this was experiments in international Christian community. Now, colonialism and racism were the biggest obstacles to fellowship in the first half of the 20th century. And intentional, small, multicultural Christian communities emerged in Asia, Europe, and the United States as a counter witness to the principalities and powers. Nowhere was European colonialism as entrenched as British rule over India. And after the war ended in 1918, many in India expected to gain their independence, especially after over a million Indian volunteers supported the British Empire against the Germans. Instead, Indian soldiers returned home to even harsher British control and the massacre of several hundred people by British troops on April 13, 1919, the Amritsar massacre. This is what launches Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian National Congress into boycotts, strikes, and other means to persuade the British to try to force the British out of India. Now the power imbalance and racial prejudice embedded within the colonialist mindset and underscored by the ancient caste system 
meant that even educated Indians were treated like second-class citizens in their own country. And yet, even in this terrible situation, friendships did occur. So I want to talk about one of those now. I think one of the most remarkable of the interracial friendships that occurred were between two medical missionaries, the Indian medical doctor, Severian Jasudison and the Scott Ernest Forrester Payton. Their friendship spanned two world wars, the struggle for independence and 20 years after. It ended only with their deaths, Jesudison in 1969 and Forrester Payton in 1970. They saw cross-racial friendship as a deliberate Christian witness against colonialism and racism. They saw that life together as a statement of hope to build the kingdom of God. And so in 1921, they founded the Krista Kula Family of Christ Ashram in Tamil Nadu. This experimental intentional community was based on the model of a Hindu family-like community with a shared spiritual life combined with traditions of Christian monasticism and the public service ethic of a Protestant mission station. Jesudison was from a Tamil speaking Christian family and in his memoirs, he described himself as a black man who suffered discrimination even though he was a medical doctor. He searched for people who shared his vision of human equality. On, and he went to Scotland to undertake medical training and began making friends, deliberate friendships with people across racial and ethnic boundaries. And it was there while working in a mission that he met the Scottish mission student, Ernest Forrester Payton. Forrester Payton was befriending international students as he himself prepared to become a missionary. And they met at the hostel of the student Christian movement in Lond London. They discovered mutual interest and by 1915 had decided to work together in India, drawn together as friends and with ideals of living out the kingdom of God despite despite colonialism and racism. Now, both men were pacifists. And so as you can imagine, they, they had a very difficult time. But in 1921, they founded Krista Kula Ashram in which they tried to, to bring a Christian community together. They wanted to abolish caste and class. College and seminary students would live there for short periods of time. Foreign missionaries visited to, to test out this, this interracial kind of spirituality. In a speech he made in 1925, Forrester Payton described the three pillars of the ashram. He said, we came to conceive of a family of the followers of Christ living together and seeking to draw their fellow men into vital touch with Christ, first by a life of daily prayer and dependence on God, so every day they got up and the whole community prayed together and did Bible study, had community worship and ate together and sang Indian hymns. The second pillar of community is love for each other, including economic equality. They, they lived from a common purse, they wore Indian homespun, and they also focused on forgiveness. They said love for each other, said Jesudasim, Jesudison means daily forgiveness. He said, that's the only secret to continuing con intentional community across boundaries is daily forgiveness. The third pillar was witness to Christ's kingdom through service. Now they were both medical doctors. So they started out doing medical work, but over time they recruited people. They did teaching, they did economic um, movements, hospitality movements and so forth. Now, by 1938, the International Missionary Council was meeting in Madras, India, and you could see that their whole method is coming full circle because at an evening meeting, Jasudasan was asked to speak about the ashram principles and that whole conference of missionary mission leaders 
voted that from now on, every missionary going to India first had to live in an ashram to learn humility and fellowship before be, being allowed to go into um, evangelistic and educational work. So a stream of sympathetic folks visited the ashram and uh, it had a huge ripple effect. I just wanna mention one of the ripple effects of this movement. And this is that several missionaries were thrown out of an ashram of East Stanley Jones and forced to come back to the US because they supported Indian independence. And they opened an ashram in Harlem. This ashram not only mediated the ideas of Gandhi to the United States, it integrated the YMCA, it started protest movements in favor of Puerto Rican independence because they said, if we're gonna oppose colonialism in Britain, we need to oppose it in North America. And here's just the faces of some of the people who lived and worked out of that Harlem ashram. Who do we see here? We see the great pacifist, John Swamley. We see the founder, Ralph Templin. We see James Farmer, who founded CORE. Polly Murray, who worked on um, compiling laws against segregation while she lived at the ashram. And Mary Ruth Reynolds, one of the um, pro-independent Puerto Rican independence workers. So you see that this idea of intentional community is something that's spreading internationally starting after World War I. Well, and so what are we to make of these many efforts toward human unity that Protestants and others spearheaded a century ago? And here I want to move into my, conclu my conclusions of what are the takeaways from the kind of activity around personal fellowship that I've described here. Well, the first point to notice is that despite obstacles, a group of prophetic Christians decided to defy the principalities and powers and live as if universal human community was possible. One exponent of this position was Archbishop Nathan Soderblom of Sweden. In his 1923 book, Christian Fellowship, Soderblom extended the notion of fellowship beyond shared activism. He said, Jesus speaks of a far deeper unity that is implied by joint action for common service. Jesus speaks of spiritual fellowship. And he said, our eyes see the divisions, the different rituals, the different ecclesial confessions, but he says our faith can visualize the unity. It's invisible but effective chains of love, and we have to live as if community is possible. For Zotterblum, joint worship and shared ritual witness to glo global community. Theological or structural unity was not possible in that post-war era. So he said, what we have to do is live as if fellowship is possible through what has already been done through Jesus Christ to build community, we have to believe it exists. And Soderblom focused on shared worship as one way of pointing to shalom. A second lesson from a century ago is the understanding that personal is political. As a shattered world sought to mend itself, restoration of human relationships and social reconstruction must proceed together. And here is where this idea of beloved community comes in. If you only care about the collective and don't care about the individual, that's not beloved community. If you only care about the individual and not the community, that's not blood, beloved community. The point is that they go together. And that was a kind of counter witness against the collectivisms of fascism and communism and, and grand capitalism. So sharing human, common humanity with specific others is a way of trying to live the world you hope to become. When the students of Eastern Europe and the US joined with the students of China and Japan to send relief to suffering Russian students, they linked the personal and the political. When Indians and Europeans founded intentional communities against colonialism, they linked the personal and the political and so on.
So, so, so um, fellowship can't be disembodied. It's got to be concrete. And that means love for specific persons. A third lesson from the early 20s is the power of creative action from the bottom up. Students, seminarians, and other Christian leaders experimented with all kinds of movements that linked them to each other. They tried many ways and often failed to cross racial, national, and economic boundaries. Conferences, retreats, pilgrimages of friendship, student hostels, study groups, food distribution, ashram, settlement houses, acts of service and solidarity, big movements for peace and justice. All of these were a, a creative bubbling up from the bottom that occurred in this period of trauma. As we suffer today from the isolation of COVID-19, let us remember what Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote in his book, Life Together. On the run from the Nazis, Bonhoeffer was lonely. He was isolated. He was teaching seminarians in secret and illegal gatherings. And he said, what is an unspeakable gift of God for the lonely individual is easily disregarded and trodden underfoot by those who have that gift every day. It is easily forgotten that the fellowship of Christians is a gift of grace, a gift of the kingdom of God that any day may be taken from us. So Bonhoeffer points out that the creativity of human fellowship must be nurtured. It must be guarded. And I believe that there's no better place to do this than a theological seminary. This is a place we try to do these things. We fail, but like Jess Sudison and, and uh, Forrester Payton said, we have to forgive each other every day. We keep seeing the vision, we keep going forward. So we need to embrace that beloved community and cultivate networks of friendship. Today, in our own time, we must look for moving examples of friendship as shared Christian practice for building community. And I'm on the hunt. I, I believe that right now, many kinds of this creative friendship are happening if we can just find them. So I'll just conclude with only one example of trying to live as if Christ's kingdom of peace and justice is possible. A recent issue of Anabaptist Witness discussed the problem of creating community between indigenous people and Europeans in Western Canada. Mennonites and First Nations people have set up processes to account for broken covenants and the imposition of Mennonite farmers on First Nations land. How do you create community out of this? People are divided over land and its resources and hardened by centuries of injustice. And in Anabaptist Witness, there's a fascinating conversation between Mennonite Steve Heinrichs and First Nations Christian leader Adrian Jacobs, which is a moving reflection on the importance of friendship as a way forward in the face of continued injustice. Jacobs talks about the importance of beloved community, and he uses that phrase as the church's witness as a public responsibility, not a private manner. He points out that caring for the land requires the public witness of friendship. And here's a quotation from his interview. He said, indigenous peoples have another conception of how we can be together and the conception is friends. That's what you're invited to, not adversaries, not debate partners, not court adversaries. We got to go back to what we said to you in the first place, the community of creation. That's what you're being invited to. And that sounds a lot like what Jesus is going to do when he comes back to this earth anyway. It's for all the peoples and nations of the earth. So the leaders of the Mennonite First Nation conversation, as hard as it is, are, are trying to recognize what the kind of things Christian leaders discovered a century ago, that constructing fellowship, as difficult as it is, is a Christian practice. The worse the trauma, the more important it is for Christians to try to live as if the kingdom of God exists. 
So my final statement here is to say that even in the worst of times, we are a people of hope. Thank you very much. Now I will introduce our respondents, but before then, may I remind all of us to send questions that we have from this wonderful lecture, uh, My Way, via the, the chat function. And now I introduce our respondent, Professor Emeritus Glenn Taylor from Wycliffe. Dr. Taylor is also a graduate of Yale, double graduate it looks like, and um, quite primed to enter into conversation with our, with our lecturer because he also has a breadth of international involvement in his dossier. Least being, not only does he teach Old Testament in a few other countries in North America, but he has taught in China, in the Gambia, and in South Korea. So may I welcome Dr. Taylor now to engage in conversation in responding to Dr. Rada. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I should like to begin with a few thank yous. One quick and the other more extended. First, thank you, Provincial Vissers, on behalf of Knox College <clears throat> for inviting me to respond to our distinguished lecturer on this auspicious occasion. Knox is a friendly next door neighbor to Wycliffe College, where I'm an emeritus professor, an alma mater to my wife, Professor Marion Ann Taylor, and the home of colleagues and a few dear friends, including Dr. Brian Irwin. Second, and far more importantly, thank you, Professor Robert, for your lecture this afternoon. As we discussed by email <clears throat> prior to the lecture, we might have met before as graduate students at Yale. Both of us are looking a little different than we were 35 years ago, so that's going to be hard to determine. Uh, but in any case, your correspondence with me prior to the lecture was heartwarming, <clears throat> gracious, and very helpful. More to the point, your extension of fellowship and kindness has shown to me very importantly and assuringly that you practice what you preach. So on all counts, Professor Robert, on behalf of everyone here today, I extend our heartiest thanks to you for a truly engaging lecture with an inspiring message. Professor Robert has provided us with a rich and deeply heartening encounter with various points in the earliest 20th century where Christian steps outside of their personal comfort zones to engage meaningfully with others transnationally by participating in what I believe is a professor of favorite, um, um, what is a favorite um, expression of Professor Robert, beloved communities. Indeed, so heartening, inspiring, and encouraging were the stories and quotes that I often found myself writing them down only to find that I was transcribing most of her lecture. For example, quote, secular politics are never enough, end quote. And with reference to the work of the World Alliance in the 1920s, quote, the personal and the political nature of global Christianity could not be separated. Peacemaking involved repentance. <clears throat> and I had to chuckle when you noted anecdotally that uh, Elizabeth Clark's comment was one of your favorites because it was one of the ones that I too highlighted on the importance of a cup of tea in the evangelization of the world. <clears throat> I could go on and on, but I want rather to focus on aspects other than Dr. Roberts' historic and biographic research. Although that was the bulk of the presentation and uh, enormously illuminating and engaging, I wondered whether it might be more interesting to focus on some of the theological underpinnings which I inferred at the heart of her presentation of Christian fellowship. So allow me to address Professor Robert's vision of Christian community. It merits elaboration, clarification, and to me as an adherent, as an adherent of generous Christian orthodoxy, presents both a challenge and a question. To elaborate, in his book, The Problem of Christianity, 
Philosopher Josiah Royce identifies the Christian vision as universal fellowship within, quote, the beloved community, a term used no less than eight times by our lecturer this afternoon. But here's my, here's, here's my main question and issue, I guess. Royce's understanding of what constitutes the Christian vision cannot easily be identified with anything like a traditional understanding of Christianity. Now, Professor Robert, I'm not in any way suggesting, much less implying that you've misled us about this. <clears throat> Certainly not, au contraire. But only that without a further understanding of Royce, which it was not your purpose to give, there could be confusion about this central issue which lies at the heart of what constitutes Christian missiology. I should add that I'm not an expert in Royce and Royce's writings are ambiguous at times at least on the extent to which he was willing to give credence to such as whether Jesus was more than a mere human. It's safe to say, I believe, that Royce's list of theological tenets that are essential to true Christian belief is ambiguous at best and overtly minimalist at many points. Allow me to elaborate. So far as I know, Royce did not claim for himself any direct association with organized Christianity and was overtly critical of many historic creedal churches for lacking the spirit of community, which was so essential to Royce. For him, though not for the vast majority of those who identify as Christians, and this is what I think makes the point interesting and relevant for our discussion today, the so-called Christian model of loyal community consisted not of adherence to tenets of the Christian faith, but was rather a combination of two things, as I understand Royce. One, quote, the true spirit of universal interpretation, end quote, and the full affirmation of the infinite worth of every individual who was part of the kingdom of God, which he identifies with the beloved community. Now, for Royce, the essence of Christianity is not so much God or Jesus, as I read him, Jesus being the church's founder, but on what truly saves, namely, the beloved community. In short, for Royce, it is not Jesus, but the church as beloved community that is salvific. This doesn't mean, of course, that Royce jettisons all of the teachings of Jesus. Far from it. For example, for Royce, it is in, it is in community with others that we can tangibly apprehend, rather than simply suppose, often mistakenly, how best to love our neighbors as ourselves, which, of course, was an essential teaching. In a 1909 essay called What is Vital to Christianity, Royce interprets Christianity in light of an historical and empirical approach that is akin to a modern day anthropological approach. He states, any religion presents itself as a more or less connected group. Number one of religious practices, such as prayers, ceremonies, festivals, rituals, and other, observ and other observance. And two of religious ideas, the ideas taking the form of traditions, legends, and belief about the gods or spirits, end quote. So the essence of Christianity for Royce, and I guess here is my real question is, what is the relationship between your understanding of Christianity and Christian mission and that of Joyce? My hope would be that we might be able to take um, the best from what both of you say and, uh, and cherish it this afternoon. But for Royce, um, the essence of Christianity is contained in three things. The first of these is that the source and means of salvation is the community of believers. Community is also the basic basis of the ethic of love taught by Jesus. And the other two essential ideas are the moral burden of the individual and the atonement, the latter of which is often um, understood by Royce to be far from orthodox. Um, Regarding the atonement, Roy says none of the traditional Christian accounts of atonement are satisfactory. Um, he goes on to say um, that um, atonement can only be accomplished by the community or on behalf of the community through the steadfast, quote, loyal servant who acts, so to speak, as the incarnation of the spirit of the community. Now, Royce at one point humbly admits, and I quote, whoever finds in the Christian gospel meanings which tradition has emphasized and I have ignored is welcome to put me in my place. He adds, since I am only an interpreter, I can feel no disappointment with my critic and can feel no painful defeat in the exposure of my inadequacy as an expounder of historical Christianity. Well, at this point, Royce's own humble admission invites me in the same spirit to invite Professor Ross 
to elaborate on her view of the relationship between her vision of Christian community and the tenets of creedal Christianity. I ask this not by way of challenge or necessarily an objection, but on the grounds of interest, understanding, and clarity. And if they're not part of her vision, which is perfectly fine to admit, I could ask to what extent, if any, could she see her vision being fulfilled by those who adhere to a more traditional creedal understanding of historic Christianity? In other words, how much that is particular to the teachings of Jesus Christ must be included in her relation, in her understanding of the kingdom of God. I ask this because to my mind, the Christian vision to be Christian is, a, is at least in any sense that merits the terms apostolic and Catholic requires a specificity that includes the affirmation of Jesus as Lord and the adherence to, as Matthew's gospel emphasizes, all of Jesus's teachings. Now, I should like readily to acknowledge that the traditional Christian understanding of global missions presents challenges to be sure, including the exclusivity of the claims of Christ. But I do not believe that fulfilling the great condition need necessarily be any of the bad things with which it is often associated, colonialism, anti-Semitism, supersessionism, et cetera, and for which there are far too many precedents to be sure. <clears throat> The eminent practical practitioner missiologist Bishop Leslie Newbigin, in a lecture given at the Overseas Missionary Study Center in New Haven, once wrote, whatever may or may not have been the sins of our missionary predecessors, the commission to disciple all nations stands at the center of the church's mandate. And a church that forgets this or marginalizes it forfeits the right to the titles Catholic and apostolic. The truth is that the gospel escapes domestication and here I see a point, number of points of resonance with, uh, with the, the things that seem so dear to your heart, uh, Professor Robert. Um, the truth is that the gospel escapes domestication, retains its proper strangeness, its power to question us, only when we are faithful to its universal, supernatural, supracultural nature. The contemporary embarrassment, he continues, about the missionary movement of the 19th century or the early 20th for that, matter, as we like to, um, is not as we like to think evidence that we become more humble. It is, I fear, much more clearly evidence of a shift in belief. It is evidence that we're less ready to affirm the uniqueness, the centrality, the decisiveness of Jesus Christ as universal Lord and Savior, the way by following whom the world is to find its true goal, the truth by which every other claim to truth is to be tested, and the life in whom alone life in its fullness is to be found. <clears throat> now, I should also like readily to acknowledge that Professor Roberts drew a lot from figures other than Royce, including William Temple. But this only highlights the value in my estimation of receiving some clarification from her on this point. Besides, what I see as ambiguity over what constitutes Christian community has a possible downside, an unintended consequence, but an inevitable one if Professor Robert was to live up to her mandate to address us as a specifically Christian audience. To me, the danger is of falling unwittingly into a sort of, dare I say it, Christian triumphalism. Thus, when Professor Roberts appropriately writes with vision and encouragement for us as Christians by saying such things as Christians tried to refabric, to re reweave the fabric of the world one thread at a time, one might say in response, Presumably, others tried to do tried to reweave re the fabric as well. The lines get blurry if we argue that Christians are those who, without adhering to the particularities of allegiance to Jesus as Lord, seek global fellowship and the kingdom of God. In other words, the danger is that we may say affirmingly of Christians in what in many cases applies no less to non-Christians, thereby privileging the reference to the former at the expense of the latter. Well, Professor Robert, if I were you, I'd be saying, I can't win. I mean, here I want to address and encourage a Christian audience with a message that I believe to be thoroughly Christian and get criticized for praising of all people Christians. I agree, but even so, I hope you will see the point and take it for what it is, a small one that you likely uh, could not have avoided in this context. My time has gone, but let me throw out a few more things. With Knox being a college in the Calvinist tradition, you might prepare for a few questions about the extent to which the kingdom, the extent to which we build the kingdom of God, 
a phrase that I believe you used in your written manuscript. And were there more time, it would have been lovely to hear even more encouraging things emanating from the Spanish flu, which has many parallels to COVID, though, thank God, not the same casualty rate. And finally, let me throw out the most important thought upon which to end. You have done a fantastic job. You are an engaging lecturer. We have been appropriately entertained, stimulated by this fascinating, well-illustrated lecture. Thank you indeed for giving us so much to take example from, talk about, and I hope now discuss. Thank you very much for your response, which in short, I take to mean, let's have a conversation at the confluence of Christology, Christopraxy and mission. And so Dr. Robert, we I invite you now to respond and please send your questions my way so I can let Dr. Robert know. Thank you. Um, thank you for such a rich response for to my lecture on theological on theological ground and of course my first defense is to say that this is a his, historical lecture where i'm trying to draw um, con conclusions useful for the present as opposed to a constructive theological lecture the the million dollar question here is what is the nature of our of community i think at the bottom that's that's what what you're raising uh, professor taylor what is the nature of, our, of Christian community? How far can we stretch it? What does it mean? Um, and in the 1920s, of course, all these conversations about the kingdom of God were hugely divisive. So for example, a lot of the Lutheran students said, we cannot bring in the kingdom of God, right? It's, it's again, like Bonhoeffer, it's a gift. It's a gift of God. It's part of our Christian witness as a gift. And then you would have the more activistic, evangelical leaning students saying, we've got to work for it. So um, it's interesting to me that, that my phrasing of the term, use of the term beloved community, of course, comes back through Dr. King. Um, I'm, I teach at his school. In fact, my office is where the guest room was, where he used to stay when he visited the school of theology. So this phrase beloved community is, is expansive and can be stretched in different ways. And here we get the question of, is this, is this beloved community um, just Christian or is it larger than Christian? Now, how I would answer is I would say that our vocation as Christians, as followers of Christ, gives us the courage to move into community that's larger than ourselves. And that's a careful distinction. And that's what I saw the great church leaders of the 20s saying, which is to say that, and that's why so many like Soderbloom said, we have to start with worship. Uh, bishop Brent, who is an Episcopal bishop who was part of this movement, also launched what's called faith and order. We start with, we have to talk about doctrine first. And of course, in some ways, you know, the faith and order movement with BIM and everything many years later, actually after 50 years, came to some common conclusions. So what you see, what I find fascinating about the 1920s, is be, the existential need for community was so great that Christians said we must apply Jesus' vision of community to the larger world. Somehow, somewhere, we have to do it. And they disagreed with each other over whether it could be just Christians or Christians and others. They disagreed whether it was compatible with capitalism or communism. They disagreed whether the kingdom of God was a gift or something they strove that they could strive for in this world or the next. So um, I would say that seeking community is part of, again, that's why I used public missiology as a starting point. As Christians, I believe practices of community come straight from the work of Jesus. 
And that's a Christian conviction for me. That is not the same thing, though, as me saying that aligns with a particular ecclesiology, soteriology, and Christology. The thing about ecumenism is we say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord is the first confession of the church, and that I believe. But how that plays itself out can differ according to context, especially when we need to cross boundaries for the sake of our own survival, the survival of the planet, and of our witness as Christians. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is to not believe community is possible. The alternative is to embrace hyper-Christian nationalism that's narrow. So I think we, the, you know, the context is important here. Um, I, know, I know we need to get on to other questions, but let me just say one last thing about context. Here in Boston, we have something called Mount Auburn Cemetery. Some of you may have been there. It's the oldest, um, you know, rural so-called garden cemetery in America. Now, I went there because I wanted to find the grave of William Warren, who was a comparative religion guy, a mission professor, and the founder of Boston University and of the School of Theology and his first dean. I found his grave, and next to it was Josiah Royce. And on the other side, a little further down, was Borden Parker Bound. And it just blew my mind. So you ask, what's the context? Here were these idealist, theistic philosophers all lined up in death on the same lane in Mount Auburn Cemetery. OK, so, so we can argue about whether how Christian was Josiah Royce. The fact that he named that essay the problem of Christianity means that what he was saying is that Christians, his view of Christians, Christians weren't Christian enough, but that the latent ideas were there that, that could be actually kind of developed and put out there as part of what we might call public missiology. So I better stop here. I wish we could have dinner together to keep talking about this. Thank you so much for the marvelous responses. Dr. Taylor, did you want to say another word or should we continue? Well, let, let, me, just, let me just say one word. And I think as, you know, that, that there are theological differences across the Christian spectrum is, <laughs> is something that we should, should readily expect. The, the one thing I would simply suggest, though, is that I don't think it's the case that there's no alternative to the vision of Christian community that you're offering. I think one is, one is, um, is highlighted in the Great Commission itself. And Jesus is locating it on the mountain which he appointed is designed to point to primarily the teachings in um, the Sermon on the Mount. And it involves forming community in the way that you're talking about. The problem, of course, as we, as we both and all well know, is that the Great Commission has been carried out in ways that uh, have often not been helpful. But as you and I probably both know from our time in Africa and elsewhere, uh, Dana, is uh, you know what a joy it is to meet um, people who um, are in robust defense of the missionary movement because it's through that that they came to find Jesus, who is Lord. And they understand and thrive as Christians in um, their own communal contexts that are not specific to the West. And that's something that we can rejoice in and, uh, and be grateful for. Thank you. No, I, I'm saying I'm one of those. So now here's a question. Um, we were just talking Matthew 24. So uh, Charles Frenchman just sent this question. Did the story of the great judgment in Matthew, uh, Matthew 25 feature in the conversations in the 1920s? And let, me, and let me add to that uh, this question that um, it, it is on my mind. Everything you've said so far, I'm looking at our situation now and saying we've been here before. So I'm asking if there are any lessons that we can embrace today that can help us make Christianity or our mission intelligible in the public square, especially now that we are talking about post-Christian world. How do we make ourselves relevant? 
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Akalatsi. Well, th that's why I liked, it's, it's interesting that um, Bish Archbishop Soderblom said we have to keep living as if. Okay. That means we have to keep being people of hope. Now, the next generation of ecumenists, namely Visser Tuft, for example, said that's completely inadequate. That's not enough. It's, it's, not what, it's not enough to, for the public square. We have to go for organizational unity. But um, I think the reason uh, that I wanna bring up the living as if be, and, and bringing back Christian hope, and again, the, the judgment of course is part of Christian hope. But in the twenties, I didn't see them talking a lot about judgment because of the serious need to forgive each other after the war. In other words, the Germans felt judged, self-judged, and, and in a way to try to move forward, those who were seen as perpetrators repented and were forgiven. So judgment was in the background, but what was mostly needed was repentance and forgiveness. And the reason I wanna go back to those three points then of the ashram, joint worship and Bible study together, loving each other in community and in service. Those were the three pillars. You often find those in all kind of heroic efforts at friendships across boundaries. And th the prayer is essential and forgiveness is essential and service together is essential. And I found that in common in a lot of the different friendships that I looked at um, over history. Now, you know what? I've just lost the other point I was going to make because I got off on the friendship point. I'm sorry about that. Okay, maybe it will come to you. So here's another question from one of our residents. What are some ways we can pursue the intentional, beloved community in the time of COVID, where we are all separated and in isolation mm -hmm. for so long? What a great question. Um, it's, it's intentionality, intentionally reaching out and continuing to worship together despite. Um, I'm, I'm currently, I'm in my intro to mission class in about two weeks, I'm bringing in a panel of people, young ministers who are trying to minister in the midst of COVID. You know, one, one idea is that of that we, we are living in a Lenten time. If you think about it, the COVID moment, it's a Lenten moment. It's a Holy Saturday moment. We, we are not yet there. We don't yet see the resurrection. This is the descent into hell. And uh, it's after the crucifixion and before the resurrection. So what can we do? We can, can I, I don't have a, a good, great answer to this. I, I'm going around asking people what they're doing just the same as you are. But the only thing I can say is that we don't lose sight of the resurrection. And that's part of the living as if, that we, we don't lose sight of the fact that yes, there's death, Yes, there's destruction. Yes, there's torture. Yes, yes, there's crucifixion. Yes, there's sin. Yes, there's horrors. And Jesus endured all of that and showed us that there is life after this. So we are remaining in a Holy Saturday moment, waiting for that news of the resurrection. And hope is what we don't see. We don't see it or else it wouldn't be hope. So I think the message of hope is essential right now. What I see in, our, in the students at our school and students at other seminaries is the millennial generation and other generations, generation whatever, there's real despair there. Now, I, I find that as an old person, right? That's, sh that's shocking, and, and, but, but I think we have to face that what is actually out there is despair. 
And if it if despair is what's out there, then pointing to the resurrection and keeping the faith and continuing our prayer journey at, together towards resurrection, we just cannot lose sight of that core message. That's where we we have to go. We keep our eyes on the risen Lord. Now that's that's not a kind of hands-on answer like you might have been looking for, but in despair, that's what we must do. Thank you. So back to probably the part of the, uh, of the answer that you forgot is uh, Matthew 25 also has this message. I was sick, you visited, I was hungry, you fed. Was yeah. it in any way part of the conversation in the 1920s? Was it, you know, something that Absolutely. propelled? Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. That's exactly what European Student Relief and others did, is that that is another thing we can do. So reaching out, remembering that these are not just numbers. You, millions of dislocated migrants, students, and others are not numbers. They're actual real human beings. And that means feeding the hungry and visiting the sick and doing the best we can. In my own community, we're, we've started a diaper drive. I don't know if you're doing that up here uh, in Canada, but the women have paid a disproportionate price of burden in the pandemic, both by losing jobs and by needing to be at home with children and, and losing their income and just affording diapers is, has become something that is, is a huge issue in my community. So the churches are getting together to buy diapers uh, to distribute. Now, you could say that's not gonna solve the systemic problem, but it sure makes a difference to those people. And one thing Dorothy Day said that I always find inspiring to me, she said, Sometimes it's easier to be working on social change and changing systems than to greet and be with poor people every day. She said, I challenge you to be with poor people every single day. So that's something we can remember too. I think it's a both and, not an either or. Okay. <laughs> One more question, and I don't know if I will you out dodge this one, but um, it asks how you cultivate intentional friendship with people who are on the opposite side of you politically and yet claim to be Bible believing Christians, yeah. like followers of our infamous past president. Oh, no, I'm not in the US. Your past president? And how does this quandary fit into your theology? Um, I, I think there, I have no illusions that it's easy. There's no such thing as cheap friendship. But the alternative is to, is if we don't try and we don't believe in it. And then we've betrayed our Christian, Christian hope and what Jesus stood for. And I first, I was um, speaking at Duke Divinity School a couple of years ago when I was working on this book on friendship. And I, I relay this incident in the book. And there were, you know, about 150 students there. And an African-American student stood up and he broke my heart when he said, here at Duke Divinity School, I can't be friends with white people. He said, they always betray me. Uh, there's always betrayal. He said, and he said, the African-American community here, if I am, I did have some white friends, but they pressured me not to be friends with white people. And I thought, here you are in studying together in a seminary. Now, if black and white students can't even try, aren't even allowed to try to be friends with each other and support each other right now. How can we call ourselves Christian? 
What hope is there? So it was a painful question that he had the courage to say out loud in that conversation. And that's the level of painful question we're getting in seminaries right now. And there's not easy answers. That means systematic, intentional, embodied relationships with each other, walking through the pain of each other. And a seminary is a place where that ought to be happening. Because if we can't do it, who can? In gold rust, what will I undo? So this is a, a final question, probably also has an answer in it. Can we describe the intention of the spirit of God in fellowship? Okay, what was the question again? Can we describe the intention of the spirit of God in fellowship? Um, the intention of the spirit of God. Ah. <laughs> yes, well, you know, I think here, um, I love the book of John talking about this, and, and I love the, um, when G after the resurrection, and the disciples are terrified, and they're hiding, and Jesus appears among, among them, and he breathes on them. Now, that breath is very important to us right now, in the midst of COVID, when breathing kills people. And when George Floyd couldn't breathe because he was being, his neck, he was, was being crushed, he and so many others. But Jesus appears and in the moment that he's sending people out into the world, and remember it's a small group hiding in a hostile world. His appearance is embodied. He breathes on them and the spirit moves out among them and it gives them the courage to leave that room and go out in his name. So the spirit is necessary for our fellowship. The spirit of God is in it. And I, and I believe that, that, and that again is why worship together is so very important. And it's in worship that we draw in that energy of the spirit and have the courage to go out. The Orthodox talk about the liturgy after the liturgy or the liturgy before the liturgy, that mission is the liturgy after the liturgy. And I like to use in my classes, the image of breathing as an image for mission. That in worship and in community, we are breathing in the spirit, which then gains strength and then sends us out into this, this continual motion. Breath is life. Without breathing, we die. And so if mission is breathing, and that's an image David Bosch used at one point, though he didn't develop it very well. Breathing is the worshiping community coming together and gaining the courage of the spirit to go out again and to come back together, inhaling and exhaling. So mission and, mission and worship can't be separated in my mind. And the spirit is in the middle of that. Thank you very much. That is a good note to bring the question and answer and actually the whole conversation uh, to our end. May I now turn over to our uh, principals and leaders? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Esther. And let me just, uh, as we conclude uh, this event, uh, say uh, I've just been sitting here the last 90 minutes and amazed at just what a rich and stimulating and provocative and uh, engaging uh, theological conversation this has been, uh, which has been more, which more than fulfills, I think, the ideals of the laid law lectureship at Knox College. And so I want on behalf of the college to extend uh, our deep gratitude to uh, Professor Robert for uh, giving this lecture, 
and uh, for providing such a, a wonderful uh, basis for this conversation to Professor Glenn Taylor for uh, a very provocative and, and rich response, which uh, I think has stimulated the conversation and to my colleague, Professor uh, Akalazzi for uh, hosting this and for guiding us through this conversation. I would be remiss as well if I did not just note uh, a word of thanks to uh, my executive assistant, Malia Bennett, who's looked after a lot of the details for organizing this event, and Stephanie Hanna, who looks after communications at the college for looking after the technical side. So our thanks to him. And thank you to all of you, the participants uh, who have uh, been with us. Uh, I hope you've found this a, a rich and stimulating time. So again, my thanks, and we look forward uh, to future events, and we look forward to the time when we can have the Laid Law Lecture again at Knox College on site and be together in person. May we all pray uh, for that day. God bless you. Thanks for being with us.